book on marriage. There's nothing, I'm not knocking these marriage books people write, but you don't find a better book on marriage than the Bible. Amen? It's the book. You want your marriage to work? Build your marriage on what God said here in the Bible. Genesis 39, verse 6. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. That's talking about Pharaoh. And he knew not all that he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. That means he's a good looking young man. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. And she didn't mean let's go out and tell a lie together. You understand the Bible terminology. But he refused, thank God. And said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. Look at what he said, folks. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God. Times ain't changed on the Word of God. You say, people call it just, uh, it's healthy for your marriage. Now, Joseph said it was great wickedness and a sin against God for you to have somebody that you're not married to. Amen? All right. If you get that through your head right there, that would cut out most of this stuff. Verse 10. And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day. You need to study these scriptures. That he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. And there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and what? Fled. Do you know the Bible said in Timothy, flee youthful lust. If you feel yourself getting ready to commit sexual sin, you're supposed to take off running out the door. Not sit and talk about it. Amen? Amen. And it came to pass when she saw that he had fled and garment in her hand, she was fled forth. She called, you know, and her, cried rape, and you know the end of the story there. All right. Now, for the men, that is for the ladies. Men, Proverbs chapter 6. All of these chapters here in Proverbs are wonderful. These first few chapters on a young man staying pure. And I want to say if there's ever been a time when it's hard for a young man to stay pure, it's now. Uh, it's a miracle to me these young men do as good as they do, some of them. It really is. It's amazing. Thank God for His grace. And He's keeping power. If you want to be kept, God will keep you clean. Amen? But I'm telling you, if you want to mess up, buddy, there's plenty of chances out there to mess up nowadays. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life, to keep thee from the evil woman, boys, young men, married men, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Notice it said flattery. You know who a man falls for? He falls for a woman that brags on him and tells him how wonderful he is. A man falls in love with a woman that makes him feel good about himself. He falls out of love, to use the, old, the new expression, on a woman that criticizes him all the time. That's why the devil gets, that's how the devil gets in your marriage. All right, verse 25. Young men, lust not after her beauty in thy heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. That's why the women fix your eyes up so pretty. That's the way you get a man. You bat them big old eyelashes at him. That's right, brother. If they ain't glued together, I mean, it'll, it'll, uh, it'll work. 
Neither let her take thee with her eyelids. Verse 26. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. That's talking about a wicked woman there. Verse 27. Watch it, men. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. Somebody will hurt tonight as I'm, as I'm preaching. And I'm not trying to be mean by any, any, any stretch of your imagination. I use the word affair tonight, not because I like it, but because that's the current term that you hear in magazines and all the TV programs and at work and everything about having an affair. Now, what affair is nowadays is a word that makes adultery sound not as bad. Adultery sounds terrible. So we've invented affair instead of adultery because it sounds just a little more respectable and nice. It's the same thing as calling a graveyard a memorial park. It's, it's like people say, um, it's like people say he, um, he has substance abuse problem. He's a drug addict. See? It's like people saying he's an alcoholic. He's a drunk. I mean, it's the same thing. It just, you make nicer terminology to smooth it over and put it in a nicer little package to make it sound better. It, instead of saying, uh, it's like saying she's a professional call girl. That's what they'd say on Phil Donahue. We have these professional call girls. I mean, he's not going to say we have whores on our program today. But that's what they are. They're whores. They are whores in the Bible. They are whores out of the Bible. You say, that word offends me. Grow up, get real, face reality. In the Bible, she's a whore. So I don't want my kids to hear that. I don't want mine to hear call girl. I want them to know that a dirty woman is a whore. Amen? And a dirty man's a whoremonger. You say, that's bad language. You better shut your mouth. That's the word of God you're talking about. That's what God said. You want to smooth it over and make it a little... Ooh, that's awful tough and rough. That's what's wrong with our generation. We've made sin respectable where it don't seem so bad anymore. And I want to tell you, and I might get ahead of myself, but I'm going to blow up if I don't. Sin is just as rotten tonight as it was the day that God Almighty wrote it down on this book pages. Just as evil. Now... Our, our land is full. McDowell County, this happens every week in this county. This scene or something similar to it. Mom comes in. Now, honey, you sit right there. And honey, you sit right there. Why, Mom? What? Now, just, just stay right here a minute. Me and Daddy's got to talk to you. And the kid kind of senses something ain't right in their stomach. Did you know a kid can sense... And they got an instinct when something ain't right in the home. They know when there's tension between mom and dad. They know when there's problems. You say, well, we fuss and fight all the time, but we don't let the kids know it. You're kidding yourself, buddy. They know it. Daddy comes in. She says, well, go ahead now. You said you was going to do it. Go ahead. Here's this little boy, little girl, looking at daddy, looking at mama. Man gets down and he said, now... Now, son, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something here, and I want you to be daddy's big boy now. Be strong. Daddy's got something he's going to tell you. And he says, what? He said, now, son, uh, me and your mama haven't been getting along very good. She's over here going. He said, now, you promised now. Don't you say that. Okay, go ahead. Me and your mama haven't been getting along any good. And sometimes, I know it's hard for you little ones to understand, but sometimes it's big people have problems that we can't get over. And, well, son, uh, son, now, now I want you to try to understand now. What, Daddy? What? Son, 
me and your mama just fuss a lot. She says, oh, why don't you tell him about your girlfriend? He said, now you shut up, you promised. She said, okay, okay, okay. He said, let's don't make this no harder than it is. By then the kid knows something really wrong. He said, daddy's not going to be living here no more. Oh, daddy. Why? Daddy, why? He said, because, well, son, I told you that just me and your mama's got problems. Now, now daddy's going to see you every day. And I'm going to call you every day and talk. But he said, but daddy, what's wrong? He said, now, son, sometimes you can, won't it be neat? You can spend a weekend with me, and then you can spend a weekend with your mama. And the little boy says, but daddy, I want you here at night. Mama, I want you here at night. And the mama and daddy says, well, son, it just can't be that way. Why can't it be that way? They don't understand. And you say, now, son, Daddy's going to buy you a bicycle. He don't want a bicycle. He wants his daddy. A little boy wants his daddy. A little boy wants his mama. A little girl wants her mama. A little boy wants his mama. It goes on all the time. It goes on all the time. They go and cry themselves to sleep. Their little heart just aches. And I'm not overplaying it, brother. It's a lot worse than what I'm telling you. And I wish you'd hear some of the stories I hear. They cry themselves to sleep. It's not long till daddy's trying to let them meet his new friend. And automatically the kids hate that new friend. Because they say, that's her fault! But my mom and daddy ain't living together. And you just might as well face it tonight, folks. This thing is ripping our nation apart. I mean, it's, it's epidemic. I'm not talking about out in the world, brother. I'm talking about in churches. And it's no respect to a person. It's pitiful. It's sickening. I'm not by any means trying to get down on you if you've been through a broken marriage or home. I mean, I understand that. And you've done the best you can. And you're going on for the glory of God. I mean, I'm not trying to hurt you. But you listen. I want to give you some things, first of all, tonight that I've never gave in public. And I don't want you to take this wrong. But I'm going to give you some signs that you can look for to know when your mate's running around on you. There's 20 of them. I'm just going to read them off. Please understand that if your mate's doing any of these things, that don't mean that they're having an affair. But I'm saying, if you see all these things and you see them suddenly, you've got big problems. A person may have two or three of these things and not be having an affair. Please, it's like, it's like there's certain marks of cults, but that don't mean everybody that does those things is a cult. You understand what I'm saying? There's certain marks of a drunk, but everybody that does those things don't necessarily mean, I mean, I go weaving down the road sometimes and I ain't never been drunk in my life. See, you understand that. I'm not, I'm not saying if your mate's doing these things, they are having an affair. I'm saying if you're wondering, and usually God lets you begin to know down in your heart when something ain't right in your home. You can sense it. You can feel it. You read your Bible back in the Old Testament, the spirit of jealousy would come over a man. He'd just be sitting around and all of a sudden he'd think something ain't right. My wife, something wrong. And he'd take her to the priest, you know, and some find out she either was or she wasn't. And if she was, brother, she was cursed. And if she wasn't, they went on and served God together. If you notice these sudden changes, you better take care of some business at home, brother, and get your home in order and pray with your wife or your husband. Number one, when you see your mate suddenly taking an extreme interest in themselves, fixing themselves up a lot more, dressing different, suddenly want to dress like a teenager again. That's a dangerous, dangerous sign. Now, everybody goes through time when they think, boy, I need, uh, I need something. But I'm talking about just all of a sudden, all they think about is their appearance. Number two, losing weight 
suddenly. Just a sudden weight loss. All of a sudden, just, I mean, just super duper. I mean, they got to exercise. They won't eat. They want, it's, it's easy not to eat when you're doing something you ain't supposed to do. Laying in the sun constantly, wanting to be beautiful, a constant, they have a love affair with themselves and constantly fixing themselves up all the time. Number three, wanting to stay gone out of the home a lot more than normal all of a sudden. Number four, suddenly being real smart to the kids, hateful, sending them to bed early so they can watch TV and with no regard to their desires, playing with them, reading a story, the kids get on their nerves or they take them to grannies a whole lot all of a sudden. Number five, they come in and want to take a vacation with the girls at work and not you not go with them. Y'all listen to me, ain't you? There's something wrong with somebody that wants to take a vacation with the girls and not include her husband. There's something wrong with a man that's always wanting to go off with the boys and not include his wife. Number six. When they constantly find fault with everything you are and everything you do, with the house, with the job, with the money, I hate this house, this ain't right, I'm not happy, never satisfied. Number seven, they begin to back off their church responsibilities. Quit singing in the choir, quit doing this, quit giving their testimony, quit wanting to come faithfully to the house of God. Number eight, they suddenly want a sports car. I mean, they're well past 25 years old and been driving around a clunker and then all of a sudden they want a fast, flashy little hot rod. Number nine, rock music. When a Christian suddenly starts listening to rock, and you can find it, look in the glove compartment or under the mattress or up under the seat somewhere. Especially 60s music, 70s, beach music, and country music. You know what a lady told me? I'll get back to number 10 here in just a second. I talked to a lady not long ago. She confided in me. She had had an affair run around on her husband. And she said, Brother Danny, she said, every country music song I listen to, it just spoke right to my situation. It was just like it was ordained, written. It fit. You know, you know, you ever listen? If you're in an adulterous situation, them country songs are wrote for you, man. They take on a sudden new meaning. They talk right to you. They get you feeling good and think, ah, why not, you know, and all this kind of stuff. That is a sure sign when somebody starts feeding off that kind of music. Number 10, soap operas. Number 11, if you're constantly getting phone calls at your house and nobody will answer and the phone keeps hanging up all the time. Number 12, they tell you they don't love you no more. Suddenly. Number 13, they begin to say you should have never got married. Number 14, they constantly stay on the phone with one of their, quote, friends from work and they're completely drab and dull otherwise until they're talking with their friends. Number 15, they don't want you to touch them at all. Number 16, they get real upset when you ask them, is something wrong? And look back at you and get mad and say, nothing's wrong. Will you leave me alone? You're what's wrong. Number 17, here's where it really gets bad. They suddenly tell you they, that you need to separate for a little while so they can be by themselves and, quote, think. If it's got to that point, you've got serious, serious problems. If it's got to that point, there's already somebody else. I know this is falling like bombs on you tonight, but that's exactly what I hope it does. Number 18, they begin to take up their time with romance books or novels. Number 19, they say, you don't excite me anymore. Number 20, they look at you when something goes wrong and say, I'm remembering all this. They're building a case against you in their mind so that when they run off, they can blame you. 
And I want to say tonight, and I want you to listen to me carefully, there is no excuse, no reason whatsoever for you to go off and take somebody other than your wife or your husband. You listen to me? Listen, brother, when you're married to somebody in the Word of God, you are one flesh. I said one flesh. I said God ordained one flesh. It's a sin for you to join your body to another person. You listen to me? I want to say some things here tonight. I've heard people say, I've heard people say, because some woman run off left her husband, people say, well, now I can understand how she'd leave her husband, but I just can't understand how she could leave her kids. I want to puke when I hear somebody say that. Yep. Let me tell you something here tonight. Y'all listen to me? Hey, you listen to me tonight? Let me tell you something. In the Word of God, it's just as big a sin for a woman to leave her husband as it is to leave her kids. I challenge you to show me in the Bible where it's a bigger sin to leave your kids than it is your husband. You're one flesh. You're one flesh. Your main obligation in the Bible ain't even to your kids. It's to your husband. Boy, that's the weakest amen I've heard. That's the Bible I'm preaching to you, buddy. Your problem is you say, well, I, they're just married. Yeah, I know, buddy. You, got, you say, well, I can understand how she can leave her husband. God don't. You must be smarter than God. He don't understand how she could. He said, let not the wife depart from her husband. Let not the husband put away his wife. It's ridiculous. God don't understand it. There's only one scriptural reason a man has to divorce his wife, and you know what that is. That's sexual unfaithfulness or a long-term malicious desertion. And other than that, you don't have no excuse. You don't have none. It's like sticking a knife in your kid's stomach. Number two, when a person's having an affair, they got a big problem. And the big problem is, and I'm talking about Christian people, people claim to be Christians. The problem is, how can you get rid of that guilt? See, when you have an affair, I've had people tell me, they say the guilt about kills you. They say you just can't drown it out, you can't get rid of it. So there's four things. Matter of fact, there's four areas that I've seen them over the years deal with trying to get rid of guilt. There's four areas in which a person tries to relieve their guilt to justify what they're doing. Number one, they try to try to get rid of their spouse guilt. Now, the way to get rid of their spouse guilt is they look to their husband or look to their wife or whatever, and they say this. They say, uh, they feel real guilty cheating on them, so they say, I've never really loved you anyway. The devil convinces them that they were never really in love. That's where you ladies has got to watch out because you get confused on what love is and then the devil will put somebody else out there and you'll think, wow, the way I feel towards him, I couldn't really love my husband. And there's where you done bit the apple, man. You bit the forbidden fruit. That's where the devil got Eve. He talked to her and talked to her and deceived her. So she tells her husband or he tells his wife, I never really loved you. We should have never gotten married. Now, you see what they're doing? You see what they're doing? What they're doing is they're saying it was a mistake to get married. So really what I'm doing by separating is correcting a mistake. Ain't that the way that old human mind works? Hey, man, I know I've had them sit right there in my office and tell me, listen, old brother Danny might be ignorant on something, but I know what I'm talking about on this thing I'm preaching about tonight. I can write you a book on this stuff. There's one thing that I feel like I can preach on. It's this. I know what I'm talking about. You wouldn't believe the people I went through this with. You wouldn't believe. I'm talking about Florida. I'm talking about Ohio. I'm talking about Maryland, Michigan. I, it's the same thing every time. You start thinking, well, uh, I never really loved you. So if I never really loved you, it was a mistake for us to get married. So really, uh, what we're doing when we separate is we're correcting a mistake. We're really doing the right thing. And that gets rid of that guilt towards your spouse. I'm really just quitting being a hypocrite is what I'm doing. I'm getting honest and being straight with you. 
You understand? And see what they're doing is saying, God wants us to be honest and straight. Honest and straight, I don't love you, I shouldn't have married you, so I'm being more honest by divorcing you than I am staying with you. That's where you get rid of your guilt towards your spouse. Or another way you get rid of your guilt towards your spouse is they'll say, well, you did this or you did that. And it did, you, 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 you worked too much or you didn't work enough. See, you was gone too much or you got under my skin all the time. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Everybody in here that's married, if you want to, you can find something wrong with your mate to blame your ungodliness on. But God don't accept that as an excuse. I've had them sit and tell me, say, well, Brother Danny, he did this or he did that. I'd say, let's open the Bible and see if that's grounds for divorce. Amen? Let's see what the Bible says and see if that's a ground for divorce. Let me tell you something. His feet stinking ain't right. That doesn't make it right for you to go out and get you a boyfriend, girls. Amen, people. Guns are bothering me because you ain't saying amen loud enough. Lordy mercy, surely it ain't that bad in here. Boy, I tell you what, it'd probably shock a fire out of us if we knew what's going on in this crowd here tonight. I'm telling you, listen, listen. You know what I heard somebody say? Said somebody, somebody said, well, somebody, he's gone too much, so I'm leaving him. Show me that in the Bible, I'll give you a million dollars. Hey, does that mean that every truck driver, does that mean that every truck driver who leaves on Monday morning and don't come back till Friday, does that mean every airplane pilot, every train conductor, every doctor has to go off and stay? Does that give his wife a right to go get her a boyfriend? No, 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 it don't give her no right. Them old time preachers would have to preach on a circuit for three solid months and be gone riding on horseback and not come back for months at a time making a living for their family. They don't give a wife no right to go find her a boy. Amen. Don't give you no right to find somebody. You say, well, she's, she's gained a lot of weight since we got married. Show me that in the Bible. That gives you a right to get you a girlfriend. Amen. That's where you get rid of your spouse guilt. Then you've got to deal with something else. You've got to deal with parental guilt. How are you going to get rid of your guilt towards your kids? Here's the way you do it. You start buying them things and promising them this and promising them that baby doll. And I'm going to take you and buy you this. You know what you're doing when you do that? You're trying to get rid of that guilt you feel for doing your kids like a low-down snake. Yeah. Amen. You say, who are you talking about? Anybody that does it. Hey, I'm sick and tired of little old kids being have their heart broken and brother going to bed sleep at night and can't even sleep and crying having nightmares just because daddy or mama's wanting to go out and have them a fling with somebody they're not married to. You say, I just can't control it. You're a liar. Get right with God. He'll help you to do right can't control it. That's where you get rid of your parental guilt. Daddy's going to have a nice apartment with a swimming pool. And every weekend, I'm going to come and get you. And you get to go swimming. Won't that be fun? What you're doing is saying, if you won't be mad at me for what I'm doing, I'll trade you these trips to this swimming pool. That is bull, brother. That is bull. There ain't no sense in a Christian concocting a cockeyed story like that and trying to make a kid swallow it. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You ought to be ashamed to raise your head up in public. Parental guilt. Here's what they do. They start convincing themselves the kids would be better off. Now kids, listen. Since me and daddy fusses all the time, or me and mama fusses all the time, really, it'd be better for you. See what they're doing? Trying to relieve their parental guilt. Survey was made not long ago. They surveyed kids that had come from a divorced home. The kids were worse off five years down the road than they were 18 months down the road. You know what the devil will tell you? Ah, oh, go ahead. It'll hurt for a little while and then they'll get over it. Uh-uh. It gets worse as time goes on. 
And there's grown people in here right now could come up here behind this pulpit and testify. My mom and daddy separated and divorced when I was five or ten years old and it hurts just today the same as it did 15 years ago. But if we're living in a wicked, selfish society, then there's a third uh, train of guilt there that they've got to get rid of, and that's social guilt. How are you going to keep from feeling guilty around your friends and your colleagues and people you work with and everything? Uh, your cousins, your friends at church, the people you work with. Here's how you do it. They say, now I'm sure that you're not going to understand what's going on right now. But trust me, I'm doing the right thing and pretty soon you'll understand. Or they give it one of these numbers. Well, see, I know this is hard for you to understand, but you don't know what I've been through. I've never advised a woman to stay with a man. I don't believe God. I mean, if a man is beating you up and threatening the life of your kids, you have a right to remove yourself physically to protect your kids. Amen? I mean, common sense tells you that. But 99 out of 100 don't have no such as that going on, brother. And 99 out of 100 have a good man or a good woman. And then coming to this stuff, you just... You just don't really know them. That's to relieve social guilt. That's what that is. There's one more hurdle they've got to get over. If you relieve your guilt toward your spouse and you kind of ease it toward the kids and then you kind of ease it toward society, there's one more big giant hurdle a person like that's got to get over and that's divine guilt. How are you going to pull that off on God? You say you can't. Oh yeah, they do it all the time. How are you going to possibly make it right with God? How am I going to get past this one? That old human mind begins to work again, jumping around, trying to finagle around, figure out ways around. And it says this. Well, God wants me happy. I've had people tell me that. They say, Brother Danny, I, in my marriage I'm not happy and I, I believe it would be better for us to separate because God wants me happy. And you care to show me that in the Bible? Show me in the Bible where it says God wants you happy. Show me. Come on, come up here and show me after church where the Bible says God wants you happy. God interested in your happiness, buddy. God's interested in your holiness. God don't want you happy. He wants you holy. Now, if you get to be happy, hallelujah, amen. I believe the Lord's pleased when we're happy. If we're holy, God wants you to do right first. Buddy, we're living in a perverted, twisted society. They say, well, well God... He wants me happy, and I know that He wants me happy, so somehow or another, He's going to cut me a deal here. And and me and Him, me and Jesus, we've had a little talk about this thing. And I'm talking about, man. I've talked to them. I've had them tell me this. I've even, I mean, you can even get to a place where your mind's so seared and you're so twisted up that you can even say, I've prayed about it and God sent me this person. Now, let me tell you something. If you are legally married to a person, God ain't sent you another person. Say amen, Brother Danny. Amen. Now, I want to tell you something tonight. Brother, we need to take this thing serious. All right, thirdly tonight, how to keep from it happening to you. How to keep from it happening to you. Now, to be honest with you tonight, if we be honest tonight here as as honest adults and human beings, all of us, all of us meet people who, if you're not careful, you can feel attracted to. You say, not me. Okay. (laughs) Forgive me. Caiaphas, Pharaoh, or whoever you are. Let's say most of us sinners have come across... Would you, you don't have to nod your heads or nothing, but be honest, people. Don't you meet people every once in a while that that you have a problem being around? I mean, you begin to spark, start flying when you're around that person? You say, not me. Well, uh, how about coming up here and finishing this sermon for us? I'd love to know the secret 
on how you can never think anybody's handsome or never think a woman's beautiful. Listen, brother, that it's common. I, Joseph probably thought that woman was a pretty woman. Maybe she was. I don't know. Maybe she what? She might have looked like Elsie the cow, man. But more than likely, she was King's wife. She might have been a beautiful woman. I don't know. Joseph, he might have had, he might have felt, wow. But he run, and he run from it. It's not a sin to be tempted. See, a lot of people think, I'd never think nothing like it. Listen, buddy, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin. All of us beat people like that. For women, here's what you got to watch out for. For women, here's what gets you girls. Looks, of course, has something to do with it. You know, a lot of times we kid around and say it don't matter, but it does. I mean, it has something to do with it. But there, he's, he's good looking, he's nice, and he understands you. I've had him tell me over and over and over, Brother Danny, he's just, he's nice. He's a nice man. And then I've told him over and over and over and over and over, if he'll take you away from your husband... He is not a nice man. But you just don't know him. Yes, I do. You say, you don't know his name. No, I don't. You wouldn't know him if you walked in the door. No, I don't. But I know him. And he is not a nice man if he'd take you away from your husband. He's not the Savior come along to deliver you out of bondage. You're watching too many TV shows, buddy, since you need to read your Bible. You say, well, I'm just in a bad marriage and I can't imagine staying in this the rest of my life. Worst things could happen, you know. You could be in the hospital with AIDS. You could have cancer dying. You're not going to hell when you die. Grow up a little bit. Face what you got to face. Hang in there for God. All of us have things it's hard to face and live with. Good night. What makes you think if you run off and leave your mate, everything's going to be hunky-dory. Is this thing messing up? Turn this down, Roy. There's something weird that happened tonight. You've got to watch out around some people. There's some people that you meet, and the first time you meet them, you think, they're nice. For a woman, it's he's nice. He's nice looking. He's nice. He's understanding. For a man, it's about 99% looks, and two, she smiles at you. That's why I tell. That's why I tell my wife, my girl. I say, don't smile at men you're not married to, and be strange. You say, good night. How old fashioned. That's what messes men up. Son, I pulled up the red light up here before. You know, just mind my own business. Look over there, and there's somebody. Going, ah! I'm talking about, hey, man, hey, I, I had listen. Old man like me. That's what messes them men up. There's a woman called me one night. She got on the phone. I said, hello, who's this? She said, this is in another state, so you don't know her. She called me and she said, oh, Brother Danny, when I'm around you, I feel things I shouldn't feel. And I said, well, you nut. Don't, I mean, don't tell me. Ask God to get it out of your heart. Ask the Lord to help you. Don't, for heaven's sake, don't tell somebody. That's the way you knock the dam loose, brother, and the floodgate comes. You feel something. Sparks fly. That's when you better watch out. Then you begin to talk. After you talk quite a bit, you begin to feel. After you feel, you begin to think. Hmm. Wouldn't it? That would be kind of neat. I just, I don't want to do nothing wrong, but I'd just like to get to know them better. They understand me. They're a good friend. Don't you think the devil knows don't know what he's doing. He's, he's not going to come at you ladies tonight and say, hey, why don't you run off and commit adultery? You say, no way. I never thought, I'd never do nothing like that. He just gets you a little at a time. That guy's nice. And then you talk and you find all kinds of things in common. And he understands all your problems. By the way, by the way, don't ever, don't ever, 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 ever tell anybody that you work with, you married, uh, of your problems. For example, you're working with a man at work, see, 
That's where 90% of this junk starts anyway, on the job. Not all of it, but most of it. You're working with somebody, see? You begin to talk. You begin to talk to that individual you work with. First thing you know, that you've got a good relationship. You're good friends. Then it goes a step further. You're a little bit better than friends. And you begin to uh, think a few thoughts now and then you shouldn't. Like, wouldn't it be nice to, if I was married to somebody like that? And, you know, blah, 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 and all of that. Don't. And then you get stuck and you have to work over. And the boss man comes in and says, can y'all stay and work over? And you say, well, yes, I could. And you say, well, won't your husband care? And you say, he don't care what I do. There's where you open the door for the devil right there. You never say anything negative about your mate in that person's presence because they see that as an open door to get in. Aha, uh -huh. see the old wicked devil's over there. Aha, uh -huh. she's having a problem with her husband, huh? I wouldn't doubt a bit. I couldn't sweet talk her. There ain't no doubt in my mind. There's men sitting in here right in front of me tonight. You know good and well there's somebody that you've got your eye on. You somebody that you've got your thoughts on. And if you, oh boy, you're just, you're just weighing it out right now wondering, should I, shouldn't I? Will I, won't I? Maybe I shouldn't. Oh boy, I'd like to. Maybe, and you're in that position right now. You begin to talk, then feel, then think. And everybody that's ever had an affair told me this. I asked them a question. They said, they said, preacher, you begin to think about it, and you know you're having feelings you shouldn't feel, and then you kind of clam up towards your mate, and then they start asking you what's wrong, and then that just pushes you toward that other person. Then you start seeing all the faults of your mate, and how sorry they are, and how terrible they are, and how wonderful this other person is, and then there comes that deadly point where you make a conscious choice. Everyone I've ever talked to, I, I said, was there a point when you actually made the choice to do this thing? And they said, yes. See, you, you debate for a while, and then there's one point, and you ask anybody this happened to, and they can tell you where they is at when they made that choice. I'm giving in. Then you turn on the old country radio, and it said, heaven's just a sin away. I think I'm giving in. And you hear another song that says, Everywhere I look, I'm tempted. I'm trying to do right, but I'm tempted. And that just starts feeding that flesh. And you start thinking, this is the real world. This is the way everybody goes through these things. I'm giving in. How to keep from having an affair hurriedly tonight, and I'll begin to close. Three things, then three final things, and we're through. Number one, don't flirt casually. Don't flirt casually. I know that you ladies, you girls nowadays are trained flirts. You're taught that. Here's what you teenage girls do when you come and say, oh, hey, hey, Mr. So-and-so, my class teacher and all that. You're a flirt. You say, Brother Danny, there's no way in the world I'd flirt with him. You don't even know it. See? You, you don't know what that does to a grown man. Don't, don't ever. You married ladies, you should never. I told my wife, I told girl, I said, never, ever touch a man. Never. You know, you're a lot of girls, they don't mean nothing by it, but they'll come out and just say, well, hey, how you doing there? Oh, oh. Skinny, I ain't seen you in a long time. Hey, you get an old pervert and treat him like that and you'll send fire through his veins. I hate to be so plain, but that's the truth, ain't it? This ain't one of my points. That's why a girl should never show her legs between here and here. Never, never. In the Bible, in the Bible, the Lord told them, cover it up to the knee, to the knee. Don't never show a man that part of your leg, girl. There's something in a man that he can't handle that kind of stuff. Y'all, that's coming nowadays, preacher. Yeah, I know, and so is adultery and rape and incest and broken homes and murder and sex crimes. That's why. Keep your thighs covered up. Don't flirt casually. Don't ever say, 
Oh, my husband, me and him fuss all the time anyway. You're just asking for trouble. If I was having trouble in my marriage, and I ain't, but if I was, I wouldn't go blabbing out in front of a bunch of women. That's a stupid thing to do. Stupid. Number two, don't let it get started. Just don't let it get started. You girls ought to have enough sense to know that when a man's flirting with you and coming on to you, you put it a stop to it right then. If you have to quit your job, your job is not as important as your marriage and your home and your relationship with God Almighty. Number three, never be alone with that person. Never be alone with You say, Brother Danny, that's as old-fashioned. I mean, we're in the 90s, we're in the 20s. Yeah, I know. And look the hell we got, too. We'd have stuck by what I'm preaching here tonight that our country wouldn't be in the mess it's in. Never be alone with them. Hey, you can never become a drunk without taking your first drink. Man will never become a drug addict without taking a first hit of acid or speed or shooting up or smoking a joint. You can never become a gambler if you won't pick up a pair of dice or a deck of cards. And you can never have an affair if you refuse to spend time alone with the opposite sex or talk to them alone. Old preacher, you just, what your, what'd your Bible say? Joseph got out of there. What's the Bible say? Flee youthful lust. What does the Bible say? You're not be innocent. That's why I told them, listen, that's why we don't let men and women work together in Sunday school classes. It's not a good idea. In classes, nursery. Well, listen, I told I told them at the bus meeting, I was, saying, I was I'm making a new rule. I don't want no bus workers on them buses where it's just a man and a woman unless they're both single. And then it's their problem, they can worry with it. Amen? If one of them is married, then another opposite sex should be on there without somebody else. Right? Oh, you say, Brother Danny, we're Christians. Don't you trust us? No! We're celebrating our 17th anniversary. Buddy, I ain't near as dumb as I used to be. Three things in closing tonight. If you've already got the... I shouldn't think that. If you've already got somebody in mind, and there's already somebody bothering you, and you know it's wrong that you shouldn't be thinking about this person, but it's getting worse day by day. And it's like a little cancer has got in you and you're thinking about somebody you're not married to and, and every time you see them, it might be somebody here at church that you just got the biggest crush on I ever was. Here's what you got to do. Three things and I'm through. Number one, avoid them as much as you can. You say, boy, I feel myself attracted to somebody. Well, the dumbest thing you can do is spend time messing around with them. That's just more like throwing gas on a fire. Avoid them. I mean, speak. Be nice. Be cordial. You know, do your job. Serve the Lord. You know, and all of that. I'm not, I'm not saying be a snob. I mean, be a snob, that's what it takes. I'd rather be a snob than an adulterer. But avoid them. Even to the point of seeming rude. Joseph probably seemed rude the way he run out on that woman. She said, Joseph, you've, you've insulted me. He says, I don't care. You can jump in a lake, you heifer. <laughs> hey, man, that's right, man. That'll make them straighten up. Hey, if there's a lady flirting with you at work, here's, if there's a, I mean, if there's a man flirting with you at work, ladies, you go tomorrow morning and the first thing he says, you say, you sickening beast, you leave me alone. You make me want to throw up. I guarantee you he won't never flirt with you again. If he flirts with you and you say, now, now, you shouldn't be talking like that. You're just egging it on. You probably like it. If he says, would you, would you like to go out and eat lunch with me? You say, whosoever touches his neighbor's wife shall not be innocent. Can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be burned? Are you some kind of reprobate? Don't you go to New Manor? <laughs> Amen. Amen. There'd be a lot. I wouldn't be in the shape as in if they'd listen to this. 
and listen, if you're already in a mess, tell it. Tell it. Get it out. You say, I'd die for it. Tell it. Uh, you better tell it. Tell it. If you don't want to tell me, call some preacher in, in another state and say, listen, I've got to confess something. I've got to get right with God. Pray for me. Tell it. Get it out. Number two, pray for that person. Pray for that person. If you got something in your heart against somebody that you know shouldn't be there and you're having these wicked desires towards somebody you're not married to, get down and pray for them and say, Lord, please help them. Help them to live right. Help them to stay straight. Lord, if I've caused them to stray or, or think bad or anything like that, God, forgive me. Help them pray for them. The more you pray for them, the less likely you are to, to want to mess them up. And number three, finally, pray against that sin. Pray against that sin. You say, well, Brother Danny, I prayed about it and I'm helpless. I, I just, I tried to get over it and I couldn't. Now that's not true. You give up too easy. It's like trying to quit any other sin. You just praying and fasting and praying. And listen, you men, you know how to look at these girls. You look at all these girls like they're your sister. With all purity. Ain't that right? He said, boy, old so-and-so, man, he's got a good-looking wife. I mean, listen, you done backslid. I've had people tell me up for, in our church before. They said, man, I just can't stand every time that girl goes to the choir, man. I just can't hardly keep my eyes off of her. Listen, you better look at her like she's your sister, buddy. What would you think if somebody looked at your little sister like that? You'd pop them in the nose, wouldn't you? That's the way you got to look at them. She's your sister. She's your sister. You, you girls, look at him like he's your brother. He's your brother in Christ. We're a family. He's your old man. <laughs> he's old. He's a, uh, you know, little, little boy, little girl. Pray against the sin. Okay. I'm through. God's used this message to uncover some sin in here tonight. I hope and pray that you'll get it right. I'd like to end the service tonight with maybe some music and some husbands and wives. When I was praying this evening, I thought, God, wouldn't it be good if just husbands and wives would crowd around this altar with tears and just hug each other's necks and say, Honey, I told my wife when I studied this this evening, I told her before we left, I said, Honey, I'm yours. By the grace of God, you're the only woman in the world, as far as I'm concerned. We're stuck together till one of us dies. By the grace of God. You say, oh, Brother Danny, you shouldn't, you shouldn't think you could happen. Yeah, I know, I know. It could happen to me. It could happen to you. you uh, nobody should ever say, I'm above it. I'd never do nothing like it. You'll be the next one if you ain't careful. I'm not saying I'd never do nothing wrong. I'm just saying, by the grace of God, my heart is committed to her. And the rest of you people with big hair are just people. <laughs> <laughs> You're just people. You're people. Amen. Amen. Boy, I ruined it there. I was wanting a crying invitation. And brother, we need to do some crying. We need to do some crying. And we need to... You know what's wrong with our generation? It's commitment, man. It's commitment. People used to, when people got married, it's committed. I mean, I'm committed to you. That's it. That's it. The door's closed on anybody else. That's what's wrong. People ain't committed to nothing no more. And we need some husbands and wives here tonight to say, Hey, honey, I am yours. You're stuck with me. And if you want to get rid of me, the only thing you can do is pray that God will kill me. And the Lord might do it. He might deliver you if you do right. But if you do wrong, buddy, He'll put the curse on you. If you've already been through this thing and you've messed up your life and you've had an affair and you'd wound up in another marriage or something like that, my advice to you is make the best that you can out of your situation. Listen, a person ought to do everything in their power to make their marriage work. If it's over and it's gone and there's nothing you can do about it, make the best out of the situation you're in. Serve God and put Him first. For heaven's sake, for heaven's sake, your answer to your problem is not divorce. The answer to your problem is commitment to each other. You say, there's just nothing I like about him. Oh, there must have been something or you wouldn't have married him. There must have been something. It's still there. It's still there. You just let all these other things cloud in.
See, the devil makes you, you can't leave each other alone before you get married. That's the devil. And you won't touch each other after you get married. That's the devil. And you need to just commit yourselves to each other. And you big old strong men in here not be ashamed. Spend some time with that woman. If you've got a woman that'll sit with you in church like this. Boy, I'm getting mad at this thing. I'm, something weird is going to happen tonight, I figure. If you've got a woman that'll sit beside you in the house of God like this, you ought to just every morning get down on your knees and thank God. If you've got a husband that'll just pay the bills and work hard and treat you halfway right, you ought to thank God. There's a lot of women that ain't got it. Amen. The world's a fantasy and it's a bunch of lies. Happiness ain't found in leaving your mate. Happiness is found in getting your heart right with God. I've known people just went from one person to the other for 20 years and they ain't never been happy and still ain't. It's the Lord that makes you right and has you peace. Let's bow our heads for prayer. All right, if you need to come, just get up and come right now. Just get up and come right now. Amen. Don't be ashamed. Listen, we're in a battle tonight. We're in a battle tonight. Just get up and come right now. You say, well, if we get up and come, somebody might think we're having marriage problems. Don't, don't be so childish, man. Get up and come to the altar and say, by the grace of God, we're going to make this thing work. By the grace of God, we're going to make it work. That's right. Come on. That's right. Come on. Maybe there's somebody here tonight. You're just on the verge of separating. You've already been talking about it. Let me give you another idea. Fast. Pray. Get some help. Get some talk with some uh, godly preacher or somebody. Build your marriage. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's going to run smooth all the time. I'm just saying sinning ain't the answer. Sinning ain't the answer. Oh God, Lord, I ask you to use this message wherever it may go, the tape, uh, the video, wherever this message may go, I'm asking Jesus' name, use our hurt, use our pain, use the problems we've been through here at our church to help it, keep it from happening to somebody else. Lord, don't let it happen to another little kid, little boy, a little girl. Please, use this message to save some home. In Jesus' name.